Today I want to talk about the difference between voltage and current because believe me, I've heard too many people tell me that there's 30,000 volts of electricity flowing through your body and that statement is completely wrong and makes no sense, so today we're going to talk about why. Now, there are three main components to every circuit that you could possibly write down. Here is the simplest circuit you can have. You have a voltage source. This could be a battery or a generator providing electricity. You have some resistance, which is a load. This could represent a light bulb or a motor. It could be more complicated than this, but this is the simplest load you could have. You can think of it being a toaster, for instance. And then through the wire going all the way around in the circuit is the current, which is called I. So you have the voltage and you have the current, and the current is electrically flowing charges through the load, which in this case is a resistor, which you can think of for this example like a light bulb. So you see, it doesn't make sense to say there's 30,000 volts of electricity flowing through something because voltage doesn't flow. In this example of that simple circuit, the voltage is the potential difference push. It is the pressure, the electrical pressure that pushes the electric current. Now the electric current are the flowing electrons which actually move around the surface, around the circuit, and through the wire, and those are the electrons in the outer shell of the copper wire that can move freely. So in the case of lightning like this, for instance, the electrical charges, which are electrons, are physically moving. So when we talk about electric current, we're talking about like the water that will be flowing through the water hose. It's the actual substance that's actually flowing, doing the work, pushing the motor or whatever it is in your load. But the voltage isn't actually flowing anywhere. The voltage is providing the electrical pressure, which is pushing those charges around the circuit. This is all summed up in the famous Ohm's law. V equals IR, or you could rearrange it as I equals V over R. What this is basically saying is that the electric current flowing through a circuit is equal to the voltage, which is the push over here on, on this side here, um, divided by the resistance. So if you have more of a push, more voltage, then with the same resistance, if this number is bigger, you will get a larger electric current. And if you have a smaller voltage, uh, meaning a smaller numerator, you will have a smaller electric current. It's also affected by the resistance. Of course, that's what's impeding the electron flow, but this Ohm's law governs the relationship between how how many charges per second are flowing and the electrical push which is provided by the voltage. And by the way, where does the voltage come from? Well, in a battery, it comes from the chemistry. The physical pushing of the electrons comes from the chemical reaction inside the battery. Question for you, do cell phones, or specifically 5G, newer generation cell phones, have the potential to cause cancer. So, you know, we're holding this little device up to our brain, which is shooting energy in all directions. And so the question is, is it dangerous? That's what we're going to talk about today. So the idea behind this makes sense. I mean, the electromagnetic wave coming out of all these devices consists of an electric field oscillating and a magnetic field oscillating, and they propagate and carry energy uh, with it through the propagation. So if they go into your brain, it stands to reason, could it heat up your brain like a microwave or otherwise cause cancer-causing mutations in your DNA? The answer is no, and I want to explain exactly why the answer is a hard no right now. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum. It's important for you to know that everything, like uh, radio waves, microwaves, anything coming out of a cell phone, along with visible light here in the rainbow area, are all the same phenomena with just different frequencies. So you can see we have lower frequencies here in the radio and the microwave, mid-range frequencies uh, in the visible light here, and then we have higher frequencies that get smaller and smaller and smaller in wavelength. Those would be the, you know, the X-rays, the ultraviolets, and the gamma rays that come out from space. Higher energy as you get to shorter and shorter and shorter wavelengths. Now, in order to cause cancer, you need to break or disrupt the bonds in the DNA of your cells. And we know exactly how much energy that requires because we know something about chemistry and chemical bonds. It turns out that you need about 10 electron volts of energy to disrupt a typical DNA bond in the DNA molecule. An electron volt is just a unit of energy. Now it turns out that about 10 electron volts is the threshold to start to do damage. Now if you look here, visible, and then we have ultraviolet up here. The ultraviolet, the right at the tail end of that ultraviolet is just barely enough 
to start to damage the DNA. And that's why ultraviolet requires us to wear sunblock or you could eventually get skin cancer because it can actually barely, barely have enough energy to disrupt some of the bonds in the DNA. But all of the frequencies below here are too low. The energy of each photon is related to the wavelength. And these photon energies down below the ultraviolet, they're way below the 10 electron volt threshold to do any damage to DNA. And so that means that the radiation coming from your cell phone is called non-ionizing radiation, whereas anything above that is called ionizing radiation. Now, just to give you a feel for this, the 10 electron volt threshold is to do damage. That's roughly what UV photon is. The photons coming from your cell phone at their maximum is 0 0.0001 of an EV, so it cannot cause cancer. All right, you only have three seconds to make the most important decision of your life. I'm going to give you a choice. Choice number one is I will give you $500,000 right now. That's half a million dollars right now. Or I could give you one single penny, one cent, and every day for 30 days, I can double the balance on what I've given you. In other words, on day one is one cent, and then I double it the next day and you have two cents. The day after that, you have four cents and then you have eight cents. So every single day you double the balance, but I only start by giving you one penny. Here's your three seconds, decide right now. If somebody asked me this randomly on the street, I'd probably take the $500,000. But let me show you how the concept of doubling every single day is a type of exponential growth. Let's see how much money you would have at the end of 30 days if we did that. Here's my trusty graphing calculator. I'm going to turn it on and I'm going to put 0 0.01 uh, in there. And I'm going to start by, that's day one, that's what I've given you. And on day two, I'm going to double it by multiplying by two. And then that's day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven, day eight, day nine, day ten. So by doing that, on day ten, I have $5.12. Not too impressive. Let's keep going. Day eleven, day twelve. Day 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. On day 20, I have just over $5,000. That's a lot of money, but not so great. Let's keep going. Day 21, that's 10,000 and some change. Day 22, day 23, day 24, I have $83,000. That's impressive. Day 25, 167, day 26, day 27, day 28, I crossed over a million dollars, day 29, I'm over two million dollars, and day 30, I have $5,368,709.12. So, what would be better, the 500,000 or over 5 million? Now it can be shown that this type of doubling is a type of exponential growth where you start really, really, really small and then rapidly accelerate up. Exponential growth, really important in math. Let me tell you one of the coolest things I know. This is the Voyager Golden Record, which is mounted on the outside of the twin Voyager spacecraft launched decades ago. This is literally humanity's message to the stars. Now, these probes will not pass close to a star for about 40,000 years, and even then, it'll only get about 1.6 light years in its closest approach. Now, this right here is just the cover. Underneath it is actually a grooved record, which has analog encoding of about 115 images from Earth, uh, greetings in many, many languages, about 90 minutes of music from around the world, literally a message to the stars. Now they had to provide instructions on how to actually play this thing back. So what they did is they etched in the lower right hand corner of the cover an actual diagram of the most common element in the universe, hydrogen. And the little arrows that are hard to read here show the transition, what's called the hyperfine transition of hydrogen. It denotes a frequency which turns out to be the base time frame needed to decode how to actually play back this record. Now in the upper left hand corner of the record right here, you see an overhead view of the stylus. Notice the dots and the dashes are binary code telling them how fast to rotate this record to read it back. 
Underneath is a side view of the stylus. This binary code tells them the total runtime of the record, which is about an hour in duration. Now on the right side of the record is telling them how to actually read the information. This is an analog, so it's telling them to read the information. It's telling them in binary how long each scan line is in terms of binary uh, coding there. And then it tells them exactly how to paint the images, which is in a vertical raster, to paint the image. Now the first image here is actually just an image of a circle before the images of Earth to show them to get the aspect ratio correct. Now this is the most fascinating part to me. This is a map of where Earth is. In the center is the Earth, and here is the plot of 14 pulsars, which are stars that rotate rapidly and shoot radio waves out. When you zoom in on this, you'll see binary coding telling us the pulse rate of these guys. So any aliens that would find it would be able to triangulate back where the origin point of uh, our planet was. Now the pulsars will slow down over time, so they actually included radioactive uranium-238 to help them triangulate the pulse rate to figure out where we came from. It really fascinates me that humanity sent this out there. I just hope they're friendly. Let's take a moment and just consider how absolutely incredible Saturn's ring system really is and how lucky we are to have such an amazing celestial object in the sky. Now, most people don't know this, but Saturn's rings, they're one of the flattest objects in the entire solar system, meaning their width is something like 280,000 kilometers edge to edge like this, right? But their thickness is only about 10 meters. Just think about that for a second. If you were standing there and looking edge on, the thickness of that ring system right there would only be about 10 meters. Now this is an artist's conception of the ring system if you were at the edge looking directly through the ring system towards the planet. Now these rings actually comprised of billions of particles. Many of them are the size of houses or large boulders, but surprisingly most of them, the vast majority, are tiny, tiny little specks of rocks and dust and actually mostly ice that are the size of a single grain of sand. Think about that. Most of it is tiny, tiny dust particles the size of a grain of sand, while some of them are as big as an entire house. Now, Saturn's ring system is truly mind-blowing. As you zoom in, you see more and more and more of these fine gaps and divisions. In fact, if you look inside of this gap, you'll actually see a moon orbiting and kind of clearing a path inside of the ring system. These are called shepherd moons, and as we sent probes to Saturn, we see so many of them, they're all over the place, and they're clearing lanes of traffic inside of the ring system. This is a false color image to show the contrast here. You can see, as you zoom in, you just see so many thousands and thousands of divisions inside the ring system. The largest division is called the Cassini division, but there are millions more as you zoom in. Now, the interesting thing about these rings is they're pretty young. They think that they actually were formed by the breakup of some sort of comet, maybe even only 10 million years ago, which sounds like a long time, but is really short time in geologic time. So very young, and actually these rings are going to disappear as on the inner edge, they're slowly attracted into the atmosphere of Saturn, falling down as sort of like ring rain, dusty rain like that. And so they could be gone in only 100 million years learn anything at mathandscience.com.